Welcome to another episode of The Lenten Table. Today we have Father Mark Aziz and Father Abraham Pham. We'll be discussing Treasure Sunday and our theme is Serving the True Master. Father Abraham, uh, do you mind reading for us the focus passage, which is Matthew 6, verses 19 to 33. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in, into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Abuna, thank you so much for that. Um, so the focus here is, or at least the passage starts off with two masters. How is uh, that topic in, in today's society, uh, serving two masters, relevant? What, what are some ways we often serve two masters or serve a false master? Sure. Unfortunately, the, nowadays, if we put it in our context, don't be upset, but our master is our phone. How many times we are on the phone and how many times we're, and what, what's on the phone is leading us. I think that's one of our masters. And I, what I would say is, when we think of two masters, we would, should say, like, it's like having two bosses that disagree with each other. You can't have two bosses, right? This one's going to tell you something. This one's going to lead you somewhere else. Can't. And in some cultures, I know this is kind of funny, but some cultures have two wives. Doesn't work. Like, which one are you going to listen to? Which one's going to tell you what to do? Having two masters, having two bosses or whatever doesn't work. One is going to lead you. The other one's going to lead you, and you're going to be conf confused. So the goal of today is how to surrender to the true master, how to surrender to God and make him my master. Now, everyone would say, oh, God is my master. I have no problem with that. But is he really? Is he the one I spend most of my time with? Is he the one that I focus on? Is money leading me? Is God leading me? Is my social media drawing all my attention? Or is God drawing all my attention? We would quickly say that God is my master, but it's in our action. It's in our daily life. So I think that nowadays we're so confused and cluttered and distracted by so many, so many masters and you can't figure out which one to follow and which one is leading us. But the one that we spend the most time with, the one we should surrender to is, is our Lord. He is our true master. We get, let's make him our master again. Yeah, uh, in the screen time on our phone, that little metric that tells you how many hours you're, it's a true indicator to how many uh, hours you're dedicating to the wrong master oftentimes. But with that, Abuna, I want to discuss some more after our break. We're going to find out whether or not we're serving the true master right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Lenten table. We were just talking about how often we find ourselves serving the false master. Father Abraham was just convicting me with how the false master is often our phone. Um, and unfortunately, if you look at the screen time metric on your phone, that's very, very true. So why is it so important, especially in the Lent season, to really understand the, the grip um, and the extent of control that this false master has on us. Because the idea of master 
it's, it's not a, a freeing idea. It's not like we are free under a master. Master usually imposes power and control over us. So why is it important for us to figure this out right now in week one of Lent and to how do we shed away from that control? I think sometimes, and I, I brought up phone, but there's many different masters that mislead us, but it seems that we're spending most of our time on our phone. And we're trying to find our identity, who we are, from, from this time on social media, this time. And I, I think that we're not going to find out who we are unless we spend time with our master, our true master, which is our Lord. So I think this, this journey of going to the resurrection, this journey of union with God, can only be done by sitting with the true master. Who's leading us every day? Who's guiding us every day? And it's not just a master, but I like what our Lord said in Hosea chapter 2, where no longer call me master, but call me my husband. The goal actually is, is to look at God not just as a, a master, but our bridegroom or our, our, our husband. So that journey should be done. And I think we spend most of our time on so many other things that doesn't lead us to the resurrection. Our destination should always be in front of us. Mm-hmm. Union with God, resurrected life. Only way we can get there is with our master or like Hosea said, our bridegroom, our husband. Thank you, Abuna. And, and this passage is also talking about surrendering control overall. Um, which is something very, very difficult nowadays, especially where everything is gearing us to have more control of our lives. We have an app for everything. We have schedules. Uh, we um, have all these tools to make sure we do exactly what we want in our lives. How do we adjust? I mean, how do we lose control in light of this passage? And, and like this passage says, uh, do not think of tomorrow. Yeah, I think I need to ask my, myself a very clear question. Is God one of the tasks in my calendar? Mm. Or is He the goal of my life? Because sometimes I will give Him 10 minutes in the morning to pray and 10 minutes, whatever, in the evening, or even one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. St. Macarius the Great says, if you pray at the time of prayer only, you never pray. It. Mm. So it's about a continuous connection with your Heavenly Father. From week one, from Eve, from the preparation, it's a personal, sacred, secret relationship between you and your Father. At any point, if you lose it, then there's something seriously wrong. So as you said, I'm always having uh, a task in the calendar. Even you as a person, who are you for me? Are you a task for half an hour to meet you to have coffee or whatever? Or you are a person in Christ, and I value you because you are valued with the life of Christ. So my perception, I think, for life in general, will affect my relationships. Are you just a task? I heard it some uh, one day from one of the girls in the church. I feel I am a task in a, in a calendar of someone, mm-hmm. but I'm not a human being anymore. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have a very busy life, great. But is this busy life making time as my master, tasks as are, are my masters, or who is my master? Mm-hmm. That's why I, f- I believe the words of St. James in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, tells me why I'm in the same point, why I'm going backward even. It says in verse 6, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Today, I'm in the church, or now I'm in the church. After an hour, I'm in a very bad company. After another hour, I'm spending or wasting my time in the social media. Who are you? What are you? And then at the end of the Lent, as Abundo was saying, I'm aiming for the, a real risen life. I don't have it. Because did you focus on having the one true master? He's telling us, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Even in the liturgy, lift up your hearts. We have them with the Lord. Is it only in the two hours of the liturgy? Or is it an act of life? That's why the church always in this point wants to connect us with what Abuna is saying on the altar, with what we pray. Yeah, just a few seconds before that, Abuna lifted up the Bruce Farim and uh, Corbel to tell us 
we declared the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord. If you are saying now, we have the same with the Lord, it is with the risen, ascended Lord into heaven. It means you lifted your heart up into heaven. And this is not an end. It's the beginning to continue. So if it's the, in the Treasure Sunday, we are asking you, where are your hearts? Or lift up your hearts? It means transfer all your treasures from earth into heaven. Abuna, it, and, and it sounds like a sequence almost because at first we're given two masters. And then, uh, so it, uh, we're supposed to diagnose that uh, there is an option here. There are choices to make and to recognize that we might be in, enchained to the wrong master. And then we're s somehow supposed to let go of these chains and then surrender our full control to the right master. So there's a progress, there's a progression there. How do we do the first step? How do we, um, s and because it often, I mean, the having a phone as your master is an addiction. It's not necessarily like a, a full, no one says, I want to be addicted to something. So how do we go through Lent recognizing that I, or at least attempting to free us from the wrong master? Yeah, if I believe that the journey, it's a journey of freedom. Then from the beginning, I have to be honest and faithful to myself. Where is my bondage? Mm. I need this wants to be broken. Mm. If you don't un uh, want to identify your chains, who is going to break it for you? Mm. And then, as we said maybe in a previous episode, you need to work seriously. Mm. So I found my bonds. And then I spoke to my spiritual father. And then we decided, or we agreed, on certain acts, I have to work on them seriously. Mm. So it's not a theory of finding who, where is my master and here in the in this uh, message we have two masters sometimes we have more than two mm. so i need to be faithful and honest with myself to define where i stand to be able to move on otherwise i'm deceiving myself and years will pass i'm in the same position and if i'm not going backward as well yeah. father abraham uh, uh, father mark was just saying that sometimes we find ourselves serving more than just two masters um, for myself and for the rest of the viewers, w what are indicators that I might be serving the wrong master? Sometimes, it, you know, it takes our eyes being open that, wow, I am um, enchained. I'm not as free as I thought I was, especially to start this journey of freedom. Sometimes it takes that level of conviction and realizing that I'm not in control or I haven't given control to the right master. What are symptoms? I would say a big symptom is always relationships, mm. relationships with others, relationships with your spouse, your children, people at work. If something isn't right, if there's no peace in that, if there's always fighting, if there's always disturbance, that's an indicator that something is wrong. I might be led by a different master. Mm. And then we blame others. Like the, the easy way is she did that, he did that. But I would say one way, observe your relationships. Are, is there some disturbance? Is there a lack of peace in it? Is there an issue there that may be because I'm serving the wrong master, right? Serving the right master, he will guide me and reveal to me those situations and reveal to me if I'm serving the wrong master and reveal to me what's my part in that relationship. What am I doing wrong? So I say one indicator, go quickly to see your relationships. Is there a problem there? That might be an indicator that you're serving the wrong master. Thank you so much, Father Abraham. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to discuss how to recognize whether or not you're serving the true master, and methods to keep us on that journey towards freedom, as Father Mark said. Welcome back to a very important discussion on today's theme, surrendering to the true master. Now, before our break, I was just asking Father Abraham, what are some symptoms of serving the wrong master. And Father Abraham, you were mentioning that perhaps looking into your relationship and seeing um, seeing some disruptions there, uh, seeing some um, issues uh, starting to uh, uh, pop up were indicators of serving uh, the, the wrong master. But 
Father Mark, are there any more symptoms to look out for? I think there's a lot. Let me share one with you now. It's the motive. Maybe I'm in the church day and night. I'm serving, I'm cleaning, I'm a deacon and everything. What is your motive? Mm. My motive, I need praise from others. I need to feel good that I'm doing such things. Mm. But let me share with you uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. St. Paul says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Even your eating and your drinking should be for the glory of God. If you choose the true master. That now I'm eating or I'm drinking or I'm serving. What is your motive? So I think any one of the good any examination or personal examination to find out why are you doing what you are doing. Is it really for the glory of the one true master? or I have my own small agendas in between. Because in the end, God will allow some trials, not temptations. So now I'm telling you, stop doing what you are doing. Stop leading the choir, for example. What are you going to do? I'm leaving the church. You cannot adore my gifts. It says, you are not doing it for the glory of God. You are there to prove that you are the best leader or the best singer or whatever it is. So I think the motive is very important to see, am I really surrendering to the one true master or I have my own agenda which is covered with a nice covering, I'm serving the Lord, I'm in the church day and night, I'm attending all the meetings, attending all the liturgies and whatever. Mm. I think just one additional point here is, we have to go back to the previous week, how am I supposed to discover that I have the wrong motive? Yeah. You need to close the door yeah. and you sit alone. I think sometimes like it, it's a blind spot. Like when you're driving a car, you can see in the mirrors, but there's a blind spot. You can't see that blind spot. So definitely need to go and close myself into a room and, and ask God, reveal these things to me. Also the guidance of a spiritual father, because it's hard to realize, because I think I am doing good. I'm a deacon, I'm a priest, I'm serving. It's hard for me to realize that I'm not really serving the master. The master is really me. I'm serving myself and my glory. So I think closing the door once again that we said in the previous week and also getting guidance from our spiritual father, these things are important during the Lenten season so we don't fall in those traps or those pitfalls or those blind spots. I think also when it's about the closed door, closing the door, it's not some, somewhere in my room or my house I'm going to lock myself in. You are, I'm moving with it. Yeah. So even now if I'm in the liturgy and I feel there's something wrong in my attitude, I need to go into my sacred, sacred room yes. to really correct myself. So I don't want to make it for myself just it's a physical place. Yep. It's a reality of a new status. I'm always in this sacred, sacred room with my Heavenly Father at work, in the church, in my service and everywhere. It's perfect. Yeah, I, I think you asked again the emphasis on uh, having a spiritual father to talk to. What kind of questions um, can I ask my spiritual father to start this conversation, right? Because sometimes we don't know. We go to our spiritual father, and if it's during confession, it's just almost like a, a dump of our sins, and we walk away and we look for the absolution um, without necessarily asking the right questions. Um, how do I start that conversation? How do I ask him important um, diagnostic questions to gauge whether or not I'm, I'm, I'm serving a master other than the true master? I think it, it's hard to see it, in my opinion, I can hear from Father Mark, it's hard to see it in one sitting with his spiritual father. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Holy Spirit can reveal to the spiritual father the symptoms and if you're serving the wrong master, if, if it's all about pride or yourself. But sitting repeatedly, start to discover, hey, this is a repeated pattern. This thing is, so I think that that's, that's, we want always a one hit, right? Like a home run. I sit with my spiritual father, my life has changed forever. I go to that one liturgy, that's it. I surrendered in that great Lent season and it's going to be better. It's a journey. It's a journey with sitting with God, sitting with spiritual father, attending liturgy, uniting with God, removing things that are keeping me from God. It's a journey and over time you'll diagnose the real symptom, the real master, the real situation. So I just, I feel like it needs to be part of a, a whole journey, but we can see it. I agree 100% with what you're saying, but I think part of it, my own quiet time with the Lord. So in my daily readings, 
he will speak to me on my own personal journey. Mm -hmm. So now I discovered that my motive, for example, was self glorification. When I go to my spiritual father, I have to expose myself exactly. I'm telling him I'm serving the church or I'm working or whatever my issue, but I discovered that I'm doing it for my own glory, mm -hmm. not for the glory of God. Then I will receive a right medication for it. But when I say they are uh, discriminating me in the church and they are not allowing me to serve and they have many gifts. So what I can tell you, you are the most gifted <laughs> servant in the church, <laughs> find another church. So I think the more I am in my secret, yeah, any secret place with my Lord, he will reveal it to me. Mm. Then I will expose myself to my spiritual father and he can guide me. I think the biggest issue when I'm going with resentment to my spiritual father, I'm good. Everyone else, my wife is bad, my father is bad. <laughs> so what, what, how, I can, how I can fix the world except you? <laughs> so I think start from your own personal yani, daily sitting with the Lord, mm -hmm. then go and expose yourself. Rather than, you know, I'm telling you there is a problem in my service or in my family. Father, please sort out my You can sort. You can work on yourself, you can't work on others. You know, it's, a, it's really beautiful because it ties in again to shutting the door uh, from the outside because you need a true barometer to gauge who you are, right? Uh, if it, the world is trying to tell you that you are perfect, you are good, there's nothing wrong with you, and if you're going off of the metric of the outside world, social media and all of these things, there's really nothing that you could address with your, your father of, of confession or your spiritual father. But if you're reading the scripture, you're seeing a completely different caliber of, of who you are meant to be. Um, is, that, is that correct? Am I? Yes, that's why in, in one of the books about St. Seraphim of Saruf, mm. they used to go and talk to him. So I'm exposing myself and telling him, I can't forgive a friend. Mm. Then they found him talking about, for example, love or something not, it seems not so clearly related to what he's saying. But because you revealed something, the Holy Spirit revealed to the Father the core problem. It's not about, and sometimes you go and tell to your father of confession, I have a, an anger issue. Fine. Where? Said my son, at work. Mm. Then the, I will discover later that the key issue is there is unforgiveness between me and my boss, for example. So I need to work on forgiveness rather than to work on my anger. Same with everything. So when the more I expose myself, the more the Holy Spirit will lead my spiritual father and lead me also where is the core problem. It's not about unforgiveness. It's not about anger. It's about hatred or lack of love or whatever it is. You know, Abuna, it's beautiful because and in, in back that metaphor, back to that metaphor of finding out you're enchained and where your chains lead to. Um, oftentimes, we need incentive to ourselves to know that the true master is good, right? Oftentimes, the world paints religion and faith as just going from one master and you know his rules to another master and his rules or more stringent rules. So how do we? truly convict ourselves in the goodness of the Father. Because even in the passage, it says, you know, if, if, if God d does so with the lilies, if your Father does so with the lilies and the plants of the field, what more will He do for you? So it shows significant love and value there, but sometimes it doesn't really capture us as, as much as it should. I think that's why people don't want to follow Christ. Mm. They feel like it's I'm a, a lot of rules. Mm. That's why I like what we said. What we were saying earlier about Hosea chapter two. It's not just my master; he's he's like my bridegroom. He's a friend. So I think that sometimes we think that we're under the rule of God, and I have to follow all these rules, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. But you saw today in the passage, like you said, I'm more valuable than in anything. I'm the most valuable creation he's ever made. So knowing that my master or my bridegroom has my best intention, has loves me that much, cares for my kingdom and cares for my present, mm. I think that we should, it, that will be easy to surrender to a master like that. Mm. I think sometimes the word master, we the think like someone's going to whip me or someone's give me rules. Not this master. Yeah. This master is my bridegroom, someone who loves me and, 
And I think that we have to have a different outlook on who my master really is. And it'd be easy to follow, to surrender someone who believes in me and values me. Mm -hmm. St. James, I think, in James 1, 25, put it in a very nice way. He say, it reads, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Is something wrong? Is it law or liberty? Mm -hmm. right. But he's telling us it's the perfect law of liberty. In chapter 2, he called it the royal law. So it's a royal, perfect law of liberty. So when we see it, it's a law of liberty. It's not a law of constraints and do and don't do. Mm. I would like to set you free. Mm. So the world is trying to portray God as the one who is going to constrain your life. He will not allow you to enjoy anything. Mm. St. Paul said in First Timothy 3, 6, 17, that he gives us everything richly mm. for our enjoyment. So how I accept the lie of the devil that if you follow the true master, you are not going to enjoy life, you have many constraints. No, I'm enjoying the full law of liberty, the royal law of liberty, and at the same time, he gives me everything richly for my enjoyment. You know, Abuna, a lot of secular self-help books talk about the value of discipline in the realm of its true freedom, but our approach in bringing this back to Lent, given the fact that that um, we're still in the early stages of Lent. We look at Lent as sacrifice and rigorous work and, um, you know, a purposeful denial of everything good in the world. But that's a paradigm we need to adjust. I mean, if, if secular you know, books are saying discipline is, is valuable and it's, it's freeing, um, how can we start seeing Lent in that same light? I think it's important because Lent is hard because we're focused again on the prayer, fasting, matanias, prostration, right? It's, but what about the healing? Mm. My relationships are, are damaged. My life with God, I'm addicted to something. I think all of us lack that peace and that. So we want that healing. We want that resurrection. Actually, everything we're looking for, why are we working? Because we want peace. Why are we after this? Because we want love. So I feel like we're looking everywhere except Him. Mm. So I think that the journey of Lent is, it could be a pitfall if we don't know that there's a goal, there's a destination, there's a new life, there's a better way, there's a better life. There's healing from my sickness, from my soul. Mm. I think we have to remember that, that I'm willing to do everything mm. to be with God, to surrender to this Master. I'm willing to surrender to my Master so I can be free, like Father Mark was saying. So. Now, I mentioned secular books. Can you actually, because, you know, from a secular perspective, any addiction or any lack of, everybody can agree that if you're addicted to something, that's wrong and you should rid yourself of it. But there is no true master element. It's just freeing yourself from one master. Can we actually do that? Can we um, free ourselves from one master without going to another master yeah, who's that, good? That's why I think we have to be a uh, big banner. There's a big difference between self-help books mm. and what we gain. As we are going to speak next week, how we are claiming the victory of Christ, we are not making our own victory by our own. Mm. And this is a big difference. Every self-help book or life coaching is trying to tell you, you have the power, the ability to do everything for yourself. You don't need a God. Mm. Even if you mention God, but you don't need Him, you can make it by yourself. Mm. And this is totally alien to our orthodoxy. Mm. We have to know we are not able to make anything, and Jesus said clearly, you can do nothing without me. We are here to enjoy his victory, his power, his restoration to the first Adam, to enjoy the fullness of the newness of life in him. Thank you so much, Father Mark. I pray that we find the chains that we are enchained in this season, and I also pray that you stay tuned, because next episode we're going to be talking about claiming our victory in Christ. So it is very relevant, and I'll see you then.